Welcome. I'm Dr. Angela Mazza, a thyroid, endocrine, and metabolism specialist with an integrative practice in Central Florida. As our listeners know, my goal for this podcast is to define and demystify the thyroid gland and thyroid-related medical conditions. By providing information in an easy-to-understand format, I hope to help patients better understand the ways in which their bodies work and to help them thrive. My co-host, Don Sheffield, has joined me for this really important episode. And I would not have missed it. What a crucial subject and one that negatively impacts an astonishing number of women worldwide. Yes. And as I learned more about our very special guests that we have today, the more impressed I have become. We are all so fortunate to be a part of this. I completely agree. Because today we have the wonderful good fortune to have someone for whom I have a tremendous amount of respect um, and someone who I'm proud not to only call my colleague, but my dear friend, Dr. Felice Gersh. Dr. Gersh is a lecturer worldwide. She's a doctor. She's an author. She's a teacher. She's a mother. She's a grandmother. Um, her, her practice is based in California. She is certified in both integrative medicine and in OBGYN. She's a world-renowned expert on PCOS, um, which stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome, as well as menopause. Dr. Gersh, we thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here today to discuss your vital work. I don't know how you made the time, but we're grateful. Well, it is absolutely my pleasure, and I would always make the time for you because what you're doing here with your podcast is so important to get the word out, to educate on all these critically important topics. Well, it is wonderful to meet you. I'm I'm really extend a warm welcome to you. Um, Dr. Gersh and I go way back at this point. It's been almost 10 years now. Um, hard to believe. <laughs> we first met through our work with Atrium Innovations, which is Pure Encapsulations in Douglas Laboratories, as well as A4M. A4M is the Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. Our listeners hear me talk about A4M all the time. So Dr. Gersh, not only... So graciously reviewed an early version of my book too, and gave a kind endorsement, which I'm so thankful for. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a great book and I endorse what I believe in. So I really appreciate that you included me in it and that you um, are getting the word out in print and verbal form all about thyroid and endocrine issues, which obviously are, I deal with as well. I mean, I my my favorite area of medicine is really uh, the hormones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and Felice, you have published some wonderful materials we want to talk about, too. So um, and we're going to have them all on um, the, the show notes. But let's let's kind of dig right in. So for our listeners, what is PCOS and how, how's it diagnosed? Well, the name if some people are now debating is not a good name and they're actually talking about changing it. But for the moment, that is the name. And it is based on the finding, which is not 100% in every woman who gets the label PCOS, but it is in the majority. It's based on the finding on an ultrasound, a high quality ultrasound of lots and lots of little follicular cysts around the rim or cortex of the ovary. To officially qualify as having PCOS ovaries, you would have to actually have a count of at least 20 of these tiny little follicular cysts on at least one ovary. And gotcha. the reality is that I order ultrasounds all the time. I have yet to see a single radiologist count anything. They So it's, I think of it as- Pretty tedious. <laughs> they're, not, they're not doing it. I'm telling you, they're not counting. I've never, they just say multiple, you know, the uh, equivalent lots of, you know, so- I, I can't even use that that label because I'm not going out there and counting them either. So it's arbitrary anyway. I mean, somebody made it, what, if you have 19, you don't have the label. So I just it. go with, you know, I just go with the flow here. If you have a lot of little follicular cysts that are around the rim, then I'm going to say you qualify based on the ultrasound findings. But that's not all that it takes to actually get the official diagnostic label. Number one on the list, in my opinion, is that you have to have irregular cycles of okay. some sort, like either <clears throat> either completely absent cycles or irregular cycles. And number two, which is equal to number one, really, is you have to have androgen excess. But it's not just androgen, which is like male type hormone. 
to actually have the label of PCOS, it has to be testosterone. It has to be that particular androgen. And it can manifest also clinically with excessive facial hair, that's hirsutism. It can be cystic acne, which only in the last few years was actually accepted as part of the label to have cystic recalcitrant, really hard to treat acne around the jawline. So, and then you can have androgenic alopecia. It's the female version of male pattern baldness that's mm -hmm. related to the androgen effect on the follicles of the hair. And so those are the three qualifications, except if now there's a new one that was just added by a group that came out of Australia. With, it was multinational, though, that they got together. They added an anti-Mullerian hormone, so ah. that's known as AMH. So anti-Mullerian hormone is, I well, it's a kind of a crazy name. You know, you think, what is that? Well, in embryological times, it causes regression or disappearance of certain structures. Like people know that once upon a time, an embryo, that's a human embryo, had a tail and then it disappears. So that's regression of structures. What this hormone does in an embryo, it causes certain structures to disappear. But in an adult female, what it really does is recruit follicles that have the little eggs in them. And they all say, choose me, choose me. You know, I want to be the ovulating one, but not all of them get chosen, usually one, rarely two. And that's kind of how it goes. And the others regress or they disappear once one is chosen to be the special one to ovulate. But in women with PCOS, that whole system is not working properly. And so you keep pulling them to be recruited. And so you have high levels of anti malaria uh -huh. and that hormone is not being shut down, which it should be shut down by a different hormone, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, but that hormone is not produced in enough quantity and it's not working quite right. We don't totally understand all of this, but this other hormone, anti mullerian hormone keeps making more, more follicles and it doesn't shut down. So you can have high levels of anti mullerian hormone and that's now considered part of the diagnostic criteria. So you can have either, this is an either or, either the findings on ultrasound of these PCOS-like ovaries with all those little follicular cysts, or you can have the elevated levels of anti-Mullerian hormone. Oh, okay. And that counts as like one, okay? You need two out of three. So that counts as one, either or of those two. And then you have to have either or the elevated testosterone with the manifestations of the androgen excess or the irregular menstrual cycles. And most of my patients have all of the above, but Got you. don't actually. And remember, this is a medical committee, group of doctors that created this diagnostic criteria. So in reality, it's a spectrum. That's why it's a syndrome. So you can have a variety of severities of this condition. Then often women who have androgen excess coming from the adrenal gland will also not only have elevated DHAS, but they'll also have circulating elevated levels of testosterone as well. So it can be a confusing diagnosis, especially for doctors and patients who really aren't into the nitty gritty of how all these hormones are being produced. So, but when you get down to it, I think that insulin resistance is so prevalent, you should assume that it's going to be there because of the right. mechanisms that come into play. The mechanisms are multiple, why insulin resistance is so common in women with PCOS. Mm -hmm. One is the gut issue with the leaky gut that causes this systemic inflammation, inflammation that pervades basically every single organ system. And that's going to include the pancreas. And when you have a lot of inflammation, it also increases insulin resistance. But it's even more complex in women with PCOS because of the estradiol issue, because it turns out that estradiol is key to insulin functionality as well, mm -hmm. and what are called the glucose transport system, the glutes. So yeah. in terms of having the proper mechanism to transport glucose from in the blood into the cells to actually get the glucose, which is a really important energy source for cells to get it to right. where it needs to go. It's impaired in women who have 
of deficiency state of estradiol, which leads to the glucose transport system being impaired. And then this whole problem, you know, escalates with elevated levels of glucose in the blood, which then causes more insulin to be produced. And initially, you will have a situation where the blood sugars may be actually maintained okay, but at the cost of really high levels of insulin. So that's uh-huh. why I love measuring like a fasting insulin. And you all, sometimes you'll find the insulin is actually high, um, or you can do it even during other times of the day after eating. The glucose level may be okay, like in a reasonable range, but the insulin is high. That's a sign that you'll have insulin resistance, but the insulin at that point is still overcoming the the problem by just having more. It would be like, I can't open the door, it's stuck. So you bring in a bunch of people and you all push together, the door opens, but you're doing it because you have a bigger team of people to open that door. So you're getting the glucose into the cell and keeping the levels of glucose normalized, but only at the expense of having high insulin. And eventually that fails. And then the glucose goes up and you also have insulin up. And when you have high insulin, you're going to be in a situation of producing and storing fat, adipose tissue. And I think we all think we can multitask, but I can tell you there is no one that can multitask by both making storing and burning fat at the same time. All at once. You can't do it. It's not happening. So you're going to be in default position of making and storing fat. And that's one reason why women with PCOS have enormously high rates, even more than the general population, which is enormously high, of obesity. It's like 80% are overweight and obese of women with PCOS. It's such a problem. And that, of course, then escalates more inflammation because your inflammatory right. cells permeate into the, the visceral fat and create an inflammatory state, which then affects also every organ system. So it's it's really it's, um, a complex thing that's going on in women with PCOS. And when you have a lot of inflammation and gut problems as well, right. you're going to have problems with nutrient status, you're going to have insufficiencies of nutrients. And that in turn will affect every organ system, including the thyroid, because if you don't have the the essential minerals that are to make the the hormone itself, you're going to be in a hormone deficient state. Exactly, exactly. And um, just to shift gears a little bit, um, as far as just going straight to menopause, you mentioned in your book that there's stages of menopause. Can can you explain to our listeners what those stages are? Absolutely. And I think that it's really important that we think of menopause in this way. It's a continuum, but you know, in a continuum, you can still have divisions. So the perimenopause, that's the phase where you're not in menopause, but you're in a transitional state. The hormones are somewhat unpredictable. They're going up and down as your brain is perceiving too little, too much, too little, too much. And it's trying to regulate through the action of the pituitary hormones to tell the ovary to keep the estrogen properly in the right ranges. And so it's very common to have too low. It's always the trajectory is always downward, but along the path down, you can have spikes up. So it's down, 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 then a spike up, then down, down, spike up. So it's really a crazy maker for women. That's actually an interesting time because the highest incidence of fraternal twins is during the perimenopause. Because really? Oh, I yeah, no it's, it's like how you would treat a woman who is having fertility problems and they give drugs to try to hyperovulate oh. them they're, or they're trying to get out more eggs. Like if you're doing IVF or you're doing egg freezing, you want to get a whole bunch of eggs out. So you give overstimulation, not extreme, you know, we're trying to cause right. problems, but they want to get a bunch of eggs out by giving higher levels of the gonadotropins. And then, uh oh, well, that can happen in women in the in the perimenopause, their ovaries are still able to respond. So there's too little of the estradiol produced. So the brain puts out to the pituitary the signals to make more hormones. So you get this, you know, trigger to the ovaries of high LH, high FSH, and you get this huge surge of of estrogen, but you can also have two eggs come out at the same time. And if if you just happen to time it, 
so that you get pregnant, you get two eggs that are fertilized, you get twins. So it's like just when women think they're getting less fertile ah. and they are getting less fertile, right. but they are still not sterile. They can be less fertile, but they're not sterile and they can get pregnant with twins. So it's a, you know, you don't give up on, you know, using some contraception ladies, you know, you don't know what's, what could be your future there, you know, right. Of, then two, but, <laughs> two, two, two right and so but it's a crazy time during that time so you can have symptoms of too much or too little but the general trend is too little and there are so many symptoms that can occur during that time and things are happening both overtly which you feel and you see but often all those symptoms are not linked to these hormone shifts that's what i want to bring real attention to that these hormone shifts and the downward trajectory of these hormones, because there a lot of times ovulation doesn't occur. Without ovulation, you have no progesterone produced at all, which is a really key hormone in its own right. And so you have a whole host of symptoms because every organ in the body has receptors to these hormones. That's why I keep saying over and over, these are not sex hormones. These are hormones for life. They sustain mm -hmm. every organ system. And it's all based on reproduction and fertility because you can't have a woman who is pregnant who has is going to be successful, who has a malfunctioning brain or a malfunctioning heart or malfunctioning kidneys. I mean, those things can happen, but those are really high risk situations. That's right. not what nature intended, right? Nature intended every organ system in the female body to be working perfectly and harmoniously and in synchrony for a pregnancy to occur successfully and do it a few times over and for that woman to be able to survive to then do it again. And whether we want to have kids or not is great. We should always have a choice, but we should understand that this is what the body was designed for. And so right. these hormones are not just about you know, one thing like having a period, they're about like maintaining your thyroid, which is so critical. It's about maintaining your neurological system with the neurotransmitters. It's about every aspect of gut health. It's about the immune system. It's every single structure in the body has receptors for estrogen. And so when your hormones are going down, it can start manifesting long before that last period. The last period, by definition, menopause, and this is a made-up definition as well, 12 consecutive months without any vaginal bleeding. And I say bleeding because we don't know what it is. If a woman doesn't bleed for nine or 10 months and then she has bleeding, the last thing I would assume is she suddenly ovulated out of the blue after nine or 10 months. That's right. like suspect bleeding as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's as, concerning, right? As a gynecologist, it's like, I don't know what's going on in there. I better, I'm not, that's, you know, you need to investigate that. That's not like, oh, well, you skipped a month. No, this is, you skipped nine, 10, 12 months. And so it's an artificial definition. By the time you go 12 months with no bleeding, you are in really a late stage of what really menopause is. It's okay. not about periods. That's another symptom of what is really what this process is, ovarian aging. So we should stop thinking about this process of ovarian aging as about periods. The periods are just one manifestation of altered hormones. If you have a hysterectomy, you still go and you have ovaries, I hope, but you, know, you don't have a uterus, you still go through this, but you don't have any periods. There's no bleeding. So we should forget that. They have the whole concept of it. It's about periods. That's just one additional sign and manifestation. And the book is to recognize that's just one sign. This part Look of at this 50 signs. And, and so many of these are happening in women who are still having periods. They may be having even regular periods, although the hormones that are being produced are not the same. The eggs are older. They're not, you know, the eggs are not the same quality. Things are definitely changing, even in a woman who is say 46 and still having regular periods and things can, and she can have so many symptoms and so many women in that age group are put on so many pharmaceuticals without right. recognition that these are signs and symptoms of hormonal imbalances associated with the first phase stage of the menopausal process, which is really ovarian 
aging. So the, the, the beginning stages have a host of symptoms, which we go into, and then you go into the, the first 10 years of menopause after the official so-called menopause, which is okay. what we define. Those years are not years that most women will have a heart attack or a stroke, in, unless they have underlying issues that predate it, like if they were ill and had all kinds of cardiometabolic problems that were pre, predating the whole process of, of ovarian aging, because there are many young women who have metabolic dysfunction, right? But right. so if you had a reasonably healthy woman who then hit the, the, the final period and she nobody was treating her. This is all like nobody's treating you because otherwise you can't really date anything if you're on hormones because, you know, you're not you don't have the marker of no period for or bleeding for 12 months. But once you're in the first decade, most women are not having, fit, fortunately, fatal heart attacks and strokes and such. Um, and But they are having vascular changes. They're having bone loss. They're having loss of collagen, which affects their joints, which affects their skin. They're having changes in their neurological systems. There are a lot of changes that some of them are obvious symptoms, some of them are not, but then you get into the next stage, which is the rest of your life, okay? And that's where all the the really bad stuff, like the halo of estrogen is gone. It's gone. Hypertension is really rampant. Right. Um, cardiovascular events, strokes. By age 65, women have more strokes and ruptured aneurysms than men. They die more of their first heart attack. They have more joint replacements for osteoarthritis. They make up 80% of osteoporotic fractures. They have two and a half times the incidence of Alzheimer's. They have tons of problems. Cancers dramatically increase during those those later years, and um, including, you know, breast cancer occurs way more in postmenopausal women because they don't have hormones and their immune system right. is not properly regulated, and there and a host of other inflammatory processes are causing DNA instability. Um, the whole system in the body of getting rid of yucky old aging or senescent cells with what they call like misfolded proteins and things. That's all regulated by estrogen. All these processes of programmed cell suicide and cellular renewal, autophagy, they're all regulated by estrogen. All those systems are in a bad state once you get out so far, you know, more than 10 years from menopause and things really start to go south. And women have a, they live statistically a few years longer than men, but they have way higher rates of chronic diseases and right. poor quality life. And so recognizing that you have all of these issues that are occurring before the periods stop, yet you have a, a sort of a sort of a little of a gifted, I call it the halo phase, the first few years into the official menopause. But tons of bad stuff are happening and lots of symptoms. And like I said, but the all through these times, so many women are put on antidepressants, sleeping right. pills, drugs for their gut. Before menopause, men have a much higher incidence of GERD, gastroesophageal reflux, you know, with the heartburn, the reflux. Right. But after menopause, women surpass men in that. And then all these women are put on you know, the PPIs, the um, the proton pump inhibitors to block the production of stomach acid. And then they'll be put on these drugs for years, like stomach right, acid. They'll never come off of them. Evil. They're evil. And we now know that yeah. that is associated with getting small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and heart disease. I mean, you need to, and then you have malabsorption of nutrients, maldigestion. Because exactly. stomach acid is not there for no purpose. And we're having all these issues because women are put on chronically on so many drugs like the SSRIs, this serotonin um, reuptake inhibitor drugs for depression. Mm -hmm. So a whole slew of drugs in that family of antidepressants. They're well known now in the literature that they increase the risk of osteoporosis. I right. mean, here we have this high risk group for osteoporosis, and I'm sure you deal with it all the time. All the time. Yeah. So prevalent. And this is a preventable disease. This is a preventable disease and right. like, and the treatments for it 
are not making the bone happy and healthy. They're like working in these odd ways. That's you know, right. Like freezing of, it. Yeah. They're like freezing it. They're, they're blocking the action of the specialized immune cells, the gobblers, uh, the, the osteoclasts. They have, so they, the, the dead yucky old bone can't get gobbled up and then replaced with healthy bone. Of course, in the beginning stages, you're also preventing them from gobbling up good bone, but you're changing the whole bone remodeling process in ways that ultimately become very problematic. And there's no good future. Like, no, when I ask patients, like, if you went on this drug or you were put on this drug by the time I see them, what's the long term plan? Like, you're right. 56. Like you're not planning on being dead in the next five years. So, um, that's why we're here to keep you healthy longevity. So what's the plan? What's the 10 year plan? What's the 20 year plan? And there is no plan. That's the no. problem. It's like no plan. So my goal is to give women a plan. First, you okay. dissect the, this is my, I am a very simple thinker. First, you define the problem. You can't fix a problem if you don't even understand it and recognize it. So exactly, you find yeah. the problem and then you find the safest, most efficacious therapeutic ways to deal with it. That's my simple thinking. That's not what's happening for women. It is not happening. No, it's not. <laughs> and and with, with all the benefits of hormone replacement therapy out there, there's still so many misconceptions amongst the medical community even. I mean, how do you, how do you deal with that? Well, here's the facts. This unfortunate study called the Women's Health Initiative. That was all well-intentioned, but the data applied only to what was studied. The data was also magnified in terms of what the outcomes really meant and misinterpreted. And they didn't look at, well, was it this so-called hormone or this one? You know, like, because they were giving the two, the medroxyprogesterone acetate with the equine conjugated estrogens, and they're like both non-human substances. Right. And um, it turned out that each has its own special, unique problems, you know, and then they didn't really dissect it out until way later. But yet the recognition that there were so many flaws in this study never really met, pub, you know, the public and, and even the doctors. Well, it turns out if you look at OBGYNs, and this is probably true for all doctors, because it's just, you know, the demographics, right? that 50% or more of all actively practicing OBGYNs in the U.S. today were trained after the Women's Health Initiative ended and was published. So basically half of all the OBGYNs were trained and taught, you know, furiously, emphatically that hormones are evil and bad. So right. oh, they have- That makes sense. This is, a very strange, this is a very strange thing with doctors. It really is. What they're taught gets embedded in their brain. And it's really hard to dissect it out. That it's is like, so true. Oh my gosh. It's like, <laughs> can you be flexible in your thinking? I know. And I know you know. Well, I right. have changed so many of my ways of. Oh, for sure. I mean, I have, I mean, and not just me. I mean, the medical profession has said this drug is now being recalled. And this drug has been in, on the market for 30 years. I mean, this has really happened. Like, oh, you know that main treatment that we were telling everybody? That's actually either harmful or pointless. Yeah, we can't do oh, that. <laughs> come on. This is so you've got to be flexible in your brain. You better keep those synapses going here, you know, <laughs> and making new ones. But doctors, for whatever reason, they're so stuck in their thinking. They like they're told one thing hormones are bad and dangerous, and you can't. I can't exactly. change them. You can't. I can't change it. <laughs> and they did a, stir, a survey of OBGYNs. This was a little before the pandemic, so it's probably four plus a little about over four years ago. And they did the survey. One third of OBGYNs that they asked said they would never. I mean, literally never, never prescribe, like absolutely never give hormone treatment to women. They would never give it. So here's my simple thinking again, okay? <laughs> we have this amazing endocrine system. You know, I always want to wear like a little, I'm a, you know, like a surrogate endocrinologist because I love, <laughs> I love hormones, you know, and, and I, but you know, they're, they're the best. <laughs> they are the best, you know, I love hormones, you know, I'm not, don't think I, you know, I don't like neurons. Of course I like, neurons, but I love hormones. Okay. And estrogen is my favorite 
in the form of Esther Dial. I can't help it. You know, we can't, we can have our favorites, but we I don't have our favorites. I mean, I love thyroid so much too. So, and here's the thing. I just treat all hormones as essential. They're all there because we need them. They have so a reason. Why would mm-hmm. I think that, well, if a woman, because women have more hypothyroidism than men, but why would I think that a woman who has low thyroid should just suffer with it? Or right. if I say it's low, but it could be lower, I should wait until it's zero? Like, no, I no. like endocrinologists treat hormone deficiency and insufficiency states. So why not treat the ovaries as what they are, an endocrine organ, and when they are not producing an adequate amount of their vital hormones, why don't we just su- supplement them? Right. We have them. We have bioidentical, like who would take a type one diabetic who has low or no production of insulin and say, that's life. That's right. Not, That's a great I mean, analogy. That is so a- what? It's just another hormone. It's a wonderful hormone. It's an essential hormone. But we would never say you you have absence disease and who cares? I mean, we don't that do make sense. that. So why no. do we treat women and their unique hormones differently or even men and their mm-hmm. testosterone? I mean, like they need That's it. A- they should get it. And I hate this. Well, it's natural. You know what? No doctor works under that premise because why are we here? No one says you have cataracts and you're going blind. It's natural. No one says you, you know, your knee is miserable. It's bone on bone. It's natural. So, you know, we, everything we do in medicine is unnatural to give people a better quality of life. And so all the pharmaceuticals, all the, the devices, that people get implanted with, um, like how about implantable teeth? You know, I mean, we do right. everything that's unnatural. If someone has acid in their eye, we're going to give them a cat. We're going to give them, you know, a transplant of their cornea. We, I mean, it's a miracle what we can do. We do skin grafting for, right. for burns. I mean, come on, like everything we do in medicine that saves lives and improves lives isn't natural. The fact that menopause is natural is ridiculous as a reason to deprive women of a hormone they need, of these hormones. This is insanity. Let's just treat it like every other organ. If we had an alien from another planet come and with an invisible device evaporate everyone's thyroid, you know, we would say, my goodness, we have all lost our thyroids, you know, and we're going to give you some thyroid hormone and maybe, you know, they need, you know, parathyroid hormone too. Yeah, we won't get knows. into that. <laughs> Hopefully but, these aliens never come, please. <laughs> but I hope not. We don't want, we love our thyroids and our parathyroid. So the bottom line is that my simple thinking is this is nutty. <laughs> Let's it just is. give, and it's like simple. We don't have it. We should get it. And we right. shouldn't wait till it's zero. We don't do that with any other hormone. We don't say you no. don't have, you have some it's not zero. So we won't give you any of this hormone until you have zero. We don't do that. So perimenopause is a time of declining hormones. And all those symptoms, both overt and covert need to be addressed. We would not, I mean, we know that we don't wait for people to have a stroke before we treat hypertension. We even call pre-hypertension. We call pre-diabetes. Why don't we call it pre-menopause? Why don't we just call a spade a spade? And I, I, this is what I do. And I call it when you give women who are in their hormonal declining years, the, the, the perimenopause, I call that hormonal supplementation when they have no longer the ability to make those hormones. And that doesn't include testosterone. That's a different skill set. We got to take testosterone has its own unique issues right. because it's not, it's a lot of it's produced by the adrenal and you don't ever stop the ability to make testosterone from the ovaries because you don't need an egg to make testosterone. So we're talking about estradiol and progesterone, real right. progesterone, not progestin that made up word. Just. So we want to treat with supplementation during the declining years and full on hormone replacement therapy when you have After. none. And we want to treat with, to get levels to a physiologic level. So this whole ancient 
not, you know, if you call 20 years ancient, right? <laughs> the whole premise from the Women's Health Initiative that came out that if you were going to use hormones, give the smallest dose at the short for the shortest time. That is insane. We want to give the most therapeutic dose for the longest time, for as long as you live. How are you going to outlive your need for hormones? You're not. You're not. So let's just, (laughs) I mean, isn't this like the most, duh, I just say, duh, duh. It's like, what is going on here? Is this like not so obvious? Like, I mean, I feel like I'm just saying, it's kind of like, eat real food, don't eat processed food. You know, the stuff they gave in the Women's Health Initiative would be a, a, a comparable to processed food. So right. we do a study with processed food and then the conclusion is never eat real organic food. It doesn't insane. make any sense. Like, this is like, it's, duh, it's, another duh. You know? <laughs> well, thank goodness you're out here educating um, physicians as well as patients because, I mean, it. this is important information that I think that um, it's so easy for certain parts of the medical community to just like turn it off. So this is so important. Thank you so I much. Dr. So. That's Harris. why I keep writing articles for t- that are published in very mainstream, prestigious, you know, medical journals right. that all the conventional docs will read it at least the abstract. You know, and, so and that brings me to congratulations on that wonderful publication in, in uh, progress in cardiovascular disease. So that was a wonderful article. So you are doing such good work, Dr. Dr. Gersh. <laughs> oh, thanks. Well, I'm trying. I have, you know, one of the important things for healthy longevity is having a purpose in life. That's so for sure. estrogen is my purpose and women... Well, are the hopefully beneficiaries. Well, we'll keep it up because we need you. <laughs> I, I hope to. I, I have plenty of estrogen in me. <laughs> and thyroid. Yeah, and for thyroid. thyroid too. <laughs> but thank you so much for your time, Elise. I really appreciate it. I just continue to admire you and follow you. And I, I appreciate all that you do. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. It was so much fun. And you keep up all of your job. You have a big mission too. <laughs> we'll do it together. <laughs> Yay. Thank and, you. And yes, thank you, Dr. Gershon. And not just for the life-saving work you do. And by the way, that was a mate. That was a master class. That was I, a master class. I <laughs> was glued to that. Um, and I can't wait to listen back to it actually a couple probably a couple times. Um, so I appreciate the life-saving work you do, but I also want to say thank you for making your knowledge so accessible. I'm reading PCOS SOS, almost done. I'm so close. I, I almost got done for today. That is just a great book. And not just for patients with PCOS, that book is perfect for, I think, anyone who cares about their health and being healthy and and living it touches on so many aspects of our lives and i literally had no idea had not given any thought to many of the things you talk about and it's just a great book so i really appreciate well, it thanks i consider if you can master pcos you've mastered the female body because um, basically everything that happens in a woman with pcos affects every woman in some way, and especially as women age. So it really is sort of like, I call it the poster child of learning about women's health and women's bodies. Well, thank you so much again. We truly appreciate your time. I wanted to do this podcast to provide life-saving education and to encourage folks to see a doctor in time, prevent or minimize damage. That's deeply fulfilling. I enjoy helping people understand how all aspects of their lives are tied to both thyroid and overall health. As always, my goal is to help us live more fulfilling lives by taking control of our health and thus feel our best. In fact, this is why I went into endocrinology. It's a medical art that combines science with the study of our lives and all that they encompass. Our next episode, number 29, is yet to be determined. And as always, we hope our listeners will continue listening to Thyroid Talk with Dr. Angela Mazza. We have many more interesting episodes and guests planned. We'll build on today's foundation and cover many topics we hope you'll find meaningful. And so now to recap just some of what we reco- what we covered in this very important episode, not necessarily in this order. What is PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome? How is it diagnosed? Is there an increased rate of thyroid dysfunction in women with PCOS? Misconceptions about hormone replacement? 
the stages of menopause, what role insulin resistance plays in PCOS, and best of all, we learn that we can impact our thyroid health. As Dr. Mazza mentioned, in our next episode, number 29, we'll discuss a topic that has yet to be determined. <laughs> um, Dr. Mazza's book, Thyroid Talk, an Integrative Guide to Optimal Thyroid Health, is now available on Amazon. There's an online master course related to the book to help guide us to optimal thyroid health. It's entirely online, live, but also recorded for your future reference. Participants can share their questions and concerns if they want to, optional, and get customized information on how to work toward healing. The online course helps us walk the talk to energize our lives. For more information, you can check out thrivethyroid.com or forward your name and email to thyroidtalk.maza at gmail.com. You can also reach out to Dr. Maza's website, metaboliccenterforwellness.com. The initial webinar coordinates with the online masterclass. The masterclass has modules that cover to topics like diagnosis of thyroid issues, personalized treatment, gut healing, and much more, plus some bonuses. You know what? I mention this every time. I think it's your time that is the most valuable Aww. commodity there. I'm really <laughs> grateful. Oh, well, thank you. And for information on at least some of the supplements we may discuss on this show, please visit the wellness store at metaboliccenterforwellness.com. Full disclosure, I personally use and I carry supplements by Douglas Laboratories and Pure Encapsulations in both my office and at our online site. Please stay in touch. Check me out on my YouTube channel, the website at metaboliccenterforwellness.com, as well as Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And we welcome your input. Please submit your questions, comments, and show ideas to thyroidtalk.maza at gmail.com. That's an email address. We may disclose your general location on air, the city or town, for example, but we will not read your name nor your address on the show. We reserve the right to edit your input as necessary. And we need to add here that we're getting a lot of letters and questions. Dr. Maza reads every one. But although these questions are like gold to us, we can't respond to most of them. Dr. Mazza has a medical staff right here on site, of course, but they do not work on the podcast. I don't know that they want to. Possibly not. <laughs> I don't know. Of course. I mean, who wouldn't? I'm sorry. I meant to say, who wouldn't? Um, surprisingly, perhaps, we do not have a podcast staff, unlike so many other shows. Dr. Mazza has to, maybe most other shows, I'm not sure. Dr. Mazza has to carefully carve out time just to do the show. And she's the technical person and editor, too. She does yeah. it all. So, so you can blame me if there's a snafu that, with no, the editing. That's no, not, that's not the point. <laughs> so when we do have a podcast staff, I'd like their first job to be acknowledging and thanking every single listener who writes in. I'm just throwing this out to the universe. Until then, please know that if your question is not used on the show and if you get no response, we are still so grateful and your input is carefully considered every single time. We hate not being able to individually respond to you. So that's just a thing. I, I <laughs> thought you should know. That's nice. Uh, and finally, please don't forget to ask your health care provider any specific questions regarding your wellness. This podcast is meant for educational purposes only.